As dawn breaks over Johannesburg, the busiest city center in Africa, hums. To life as hundreds and thousands of South Africans stream into the city to chase their piece of the golden dream. Thanks to a vibrant revitalization effort over the past couple of years, the Johannesburg CBD is the vital center of life for the many who study, work and play there. And now, Clinix's first day hospital is right in the heart of the CBD to help sustain and enhance that life. So Clinics has got the longest history in the country of providing a platform for black professionals in particular to be able to deliver care in the private sector and our, one, our oldest hospital in the group, Dr. S.K. Matseke, has been doing this since 1985 and we have got a great experience and we have got a large network of specialists across our facilities who are highly skilled uh, in the different uh, disciplines of, uh, of medicine. We are really uh, in a very good position to be able to make those uh, skills and expertise available to the communities and uh, the people who work and live in and around the job CBD. For more than 30 years, the clinics group has been striving to identify opportunities and meaningful ways to pay tribute to our founding fathers who epitomized the concept of black excellence from the start. And it is in tribute to these visionaries that this hospital is named after the astute businessman and legal expert, Dr. G.M. Bigia. Dr. Bigia was, uh, to me, he, he was very, very special. Uh, from the home front, uh, he was my father's best friend. And uh, there would never be any important uh, occasion happening at home without uh, so he's always been there. Uh, at, at some stage in my life, I went through difficult times. He was there for me. And when I went through my difficult times, we were there to listen to me. When he went through his difficult times, when he had cancer, I was there to look after him. So I, I've got that special relationship. He, he's, a, he's a community leader to me. He's my father to me. He's, he's everything. The founding fathers, like him, is Dr. B.J., but actually he was a lawyer. Okay. Dr. Tato Matlala was a doctor, but a businessman. Dr. Mukhesi was a doctor, visionary, a businessman as well. In, what, in whatever they did, they were quite diverse. Possibly, if you look into his contribution in law, you'll find that it's major. Uh, he was the first president of, of uh, Black Lawyers Association. If you went into education, you will find that it also features in education. So they, they, were, they were a special breed of people that worked across their disciplines. The Dr. G. M. Bigger Day Hospital at 56 Von Biller Street in the heart of Joburg offers healthcare services in dentistry, dermatology, optometry, ophthalmology, physiotherapy, audiology, ear, nose and throat surgery, orthopedics, gynecology, pediatrics, maxillofacial surgery, as well as general elective surgery. The 36 beds in the state-of-the-art wards and private rooms provide a safe and comfortable space for patients to recover from same-day surgeries under expert supervision. The facility also offers doctor suites for consultations with GPs and specialists for all who work and live in the city. For the convenience of all its patients, the Dr. G. M. Bikia Day Hospital offers safe and secure parking and the use of a courtesy shuttle service for patients who need to be transported between other clinics facilities. You know, the business of clinics has always been to take care of the previously historically underprivileged uh, people and uh, we know that uh, our city centers are full of such people. Our 
city centers are now full of people from outside our borders, uh, from uh, the, 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 the Africa, the north of, of, of where we are. And um, those people have not have had that, uh, they, they haven't had that, uh, the privilege of having the facility like the clinics, the hospital uh, that is coming up now. So this is going to be a fantastic uh, service for, for all of them. And uh, we hope that um, the people will uh, see the advantage of, uh, uh, you know, being serviced close to their, where they are. I think that's the whole idea of clinics, to serve people closest to where they live. It is this ethos of excellence that provides a haven of health care for the denizens of Africa's busiest city. The Dr. D. M. B. K. Day Hospital at 56 Von Biller Street in the heart of Josie is open to all every day of the week from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. and welcomes all medical aids. And it serves as a fitting memorial to a remarkable man who dedicated his life to excellence. Good evening, colleagues, and once more, welcome to our weekly webinars hosted by Clinics Health Group. My name is Raymond Dela. I'm a group medical officer at Clinics Health Group. And it's always a pleasure to meet with you every week on a Thursday evening between 6 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. as we host this uh, uh, exciting uh, discussions on uh, continuing medical education uh, brought to you by Clinics Health Group. We've been having this uh, session since the beginning of the lockdown when uh, COVID uh, hit us, all of, all of us, all over the world and in South Africa in particular. And we were staying home and we had to find a way of communicating with colleagues, patients, and all friends uh, that we are, uh, have become accustomed to meeting physically. And this uh, has been a a good place, a good meeting place as we share knowledge and information from experts in the various fields within the medical fraternity. And we are glad that you are always available and uh, you respond uh, so well every week when we invite you uh, to these webinars because we know that without you being participants in this webinars, we won't be able to continue this webinar. So thank you very much uh, for joining us once more. And just note that these webinars are CPD accredited and we request that as you uh, register, you give us your full details, indicating your full names and your uh, registration number according to the regulatory body that you're registered with. Uh, primarily most of you are with the HPCSA. We know that some of you are with the, with the pharmacy council or the nursing council or the Allotted professionals councils. And well, we know that there are some also members of the public who are working within the medical space who are also gaining a lot of knowledge from this webinar. So we, we want to thank you for joining us uh, every week. And note that these uh, webinars are um, streamed live on, 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 on YouTube, in as much as we do it on, on, on Zoom at the moment. And um, we also record this webinar so we request your permission to, to request this uh, on, on social media. And the following day, you will receive the, the recordings so that you can then go back and watch the, the presentations and maybe information that you might have missed at your leisure at home, you may be or in your practice, you may be able to look at and watch and listen to the presentations. And uh, also note that uh, we request that when you log in, you mute yourselves and switch off the videos just to enhance the quality of sound, uh, also the, uh, the the reception that you may be having. We know that from time to time we've got load shedding, but we're glad that at least in the last few week, uh, days that we've not had load shedding and we are uh, hopeful that uh, there will be any load shedding in the coming days. And so this evening, we are quite excited to be bringing you an expert in the field of HIV AIDS, uh, Dr. Lawrence Mbobo, who's 
uh, generously accepted an invitation to come and spend the evening with us and share his knowledge and experience and expertise on this important subject of HIV. And the topic being HIV, pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP, with a focus on women, knowing that this is Women's Month, so we thought we should have something that uh, deals with the women issues. And Dr. Loras Mobo is the director of uh, Dr. Loras Mobo Incorporated. He's an HIV clinician with extensive experience and expertise, and has been in private medical practice, mainly in the center of Johannesburg since 1987. He's also working uh, within uh, this hospital that you've just showcased now, the GMPJ, which is in the CBD, in the heart of Johannesburg, uh, GMPJ, where he's also has got his practice. Um, the practice that he's running since 1987 offers comprehensive medical services with emphasis on specialized HIV management. And Dr. Bob is a recipient of the best of HIV care award from Discovery Health. And he is the medical advice, he was a medical advisor to Anglo American Health Services. Uh, from 2003 to 2004, uh, through the wellness campaigns that he runs in conjunction with Careways, he was part of the team that devised packages and advise corporate entities. So we are in good hands and uh, advising corporate entities and their clients on the mechanism on how to cope and develop lifelong skills in managing chronic conditions such as HIV infection and AIDS, hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. And from 2003 to date, Dr. Mbobo has been a lecturer and a facilitator in HIV management, tuberculosis, tuberculosis, sexually transmitted disease infections, palliative care, and non-communicable diseases for the international NGOs, the pharmaceutical industry, and government. Notably, the Foundation for Professional Development and uh, several others like World Region AIDS, as in different RV. He's, he has an MBCH from the University of Zimbabwe, also, he's got a, a, a medical, he's, got, he's got a qualification also from Manchester University Business School, and also is a member of the Care International Associate of Providers in HIV AIDS Care uh, from uh, the Garden Institute in the USA. And also he was a, train, a trainer from Macrofle Learning Academy. So we are glad to have you this evening, Dr. Bob, and uh, please, uh, share your knowledge and expertise with us, uh, with colleagues who are locked in this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bila, um, uh, for introducing me and um, for giving me this opportunity to, to share with colleagues and uh, fellow um, clinicians. Um, on this important topic. Um, as a way of starting this uh, chat, it was by mistake, by the way, that I, I accepted this invitation to, uh, to um, facilitate or to, to give this talk. I was just taking a walk down uh, from my rooms and uh, I went down to, uh, to Dr. Um, uh, Bilas, uh, uh, office and I found him working on the computer and uh, by chance he said um, who are you and what are you doing and I, I told him a brief about myself and he said can you accept an invitation to be able to uh, to do a, a presentation on the uh, women's day uh, sometime in Thursday I quickly accepted that because uh, apart from clinical work I spend most of my time doing um, uh, uh, training across uh, the board. Perhaps for the purposes of us this, uh, starting this discussion, I would like to be able to share the screen and begin the talk because we we want to uh, reserve quite a lot of uh, of our time um, discussing quite a good number of questions around HIV. It's an exciting topic in a sense because. We're seeing um, uh, part of the agenda for uh, women's health, uh, HIV fits the bill quite clearly. It's one of the most important things uh, that we should be able to consider when we're looking at the package of HIV prevention. 
Uh, in the next uh, 45 minutes, we'll, uh, I expect to be able to share with you about a PrEP. PrEP has been around uh, with us and uh, South Africa was the first uh, uh, country on the African continent to be able to approve the use of HIV PrEP. Uh, uh, with the understanding that prevention is not better than cure, it is actually the cure. Uh, so PrEP has been around since 2016 and we can see there uh, the former minister and the current president of health and the, the deputy minister at the launch of, uh, the, of the HIV PrEP down in Devon. So what we intend to do in the next few sessions is to make a distinction between uh, PrEP and PEP. I appreciate why HIV's uh, PrEP is beneficial to women. And I'll try to make a case for HIV PrEP in women uh, so that uh, at the end of this session, participants are, will be able to uh, go back to their practices and be able to uh, create a demand for HIV uh, PrEP. We'll also look at the eligibility of, of uh, criteria for PrEP, uh, starting with the oral PrEP, and then later on, we'll be able to uh, look at long acting uh, uh, PrEP as well. We'll also look at how you actually start and follow up patients on pre-exposure prophylaxis. So what is the definition of PrEP? PrEP is defined as, um, as opposed to post-exposure prophylaxis, giving um, some medication, some injection, or something to prevent the infection taking hold before uh, uh, the person actually has it. So it's a pre-exposure. It begins at, with treatment earlier before the exposure, which might increase uh, the prophylactic effect. And this, by the way, is something that we are uh, fairly familiar with in clinical practice. Uh, malaria is one of those yellow fever. Before you go to an endemic area, you typically would uh, receive some form of uh, tablets or an, a vaccine before you, you get to that endemic area. In this context, we're saying basically um, uh, PrEP is for persons with ongoing or repeated HIV exposure or some intermittent, uh, intermittent exposure where we're saying post-exposure prophylaxis may not be adequate. So it's quite important to be able to make a distinction between uh, post and uh, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. So we'll see quite clearly that those at risk um, with an ongoing risk uh, of HIV uh, uh, will actually fit this bill of pre-exposure prophylaxis. So the definition of PrEP is involves taking a pharmaceutical agent prior to the exposure to prevent an outcome. So basically you're giving a tablet before the exposure to be able to prevent that outcome. In the context of HIV, we're saying the use of ARVs, uh, TDF and FTC uh, would be fit the bill of, of, of PrEP as oral PrEP. So let's quickly have a look at uh, the South African HIV stats at a glance. And this is the most recent stats that we have, the 2020 uh, statistics. Um, the South Africa has a, pop a population of 60 million of that, 7.8 million people are living with HIV. Uh, and in numbers, this is the world's largest HIV uh, epidemic. So the epicenter is in South Africa. Uh, with a prevalence of 19.1% being the fourth uh, highest uh, prevalence in the world after Eswatini, Lesotho, and also Botswana. I would like to, you to pay particular attention to um, the new infections because that will be the focus of our discussion uh, when we're looking at um, HIV PrEP. It's occurring, those 230 new infections that are occurring every, every year amongst the adolescent girls and young women who are most likely to fall pregnant. They are said to be 2.5 times. And if you're looking at literature, some even suggest three times more likely to, uh, 
to have HIV uh, compared to males uh, in the same age group. And we're saying of the estimated 7.8 million South Africans living with HIV, nearly 60% of these are over the age of 15, and these are, are women. Uh, when you're looking at the deaths, interestingly, the deaths, the males, more males die from, uh, from, from HIV than, than, than females. Uh, it tells us a, a different picture there, but I want you to focus mainly on the, the rate of new infections, that's the HIV incidence. There are many reasons why adolescent girls and young women are prone to um, HIV. You could put them into boxes, um, biological, social, and structural, and this has to do with high rates of teenage pregnancies, gender based uh, and interpersonal violence, which is a common uh, feature of the South African uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, landscape, um, lack of quality education, widespread poverty and unemployment. Uh, COVID-19 has not made it easier for most people. High rates of STIs, uh, particularly the happy simplex uh, virus, which increases viral, uh, uh, viral uh, shedding, uh, HIV shedding, mental health issues associated with alcohol and drug abuse and other high risk behaviors that come with it. The cultural and traditional risk factors that we can talk about. And indeed the, the legacy of apartheid that we are still grappling with it, uh, many years after uh, the end of apartheid. So you can put quite a good number of things there into some boxes, structural, biological, social, and uh, we know women are at higher risk as a result of these factors. We could discuss this a bit more, but um, for the sake of time, we'd want to be able to, to continue. What is the local context? Uh, we say basically um, women continue to bear the brunt of, of, of the burden of HIV disproportionately. And if you're looking at the, the recent statistics, we're saying basically the, the prevalence in women is about 21.5% 20, compared to 13% in, in, in men. And we're saying violence remains the order of the day. And the effect of violence actually is that it discourages HIV testing, starting and staying on art. It also has an issue of, of trying to drive other factors as well. And interestingly, um, when we're looking at the plonking another picture into it, men in South Africa are less likely than women to use HIV services, including testing and starting uh, and staying on art. This has an impact on women, if you like, men not being interested in, 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 in particular issues. It's estimated if you're looking at uh, those at risk that about um, more than 57% uh, 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 of sex workers are actually infected. And female sex workers with HIV are cons consistently less likely to know the HIV status than other women uh, uh, overall. So we're saying quite clearly, there's a preponderance of HIV in, in women. The good news is that 72% of people are on art. We have the largest art program in the world. Mother-child transmission has dropped significantly from a high. If you're looking at 2005, we're sitting at around 8.5%. It dropped down to 3.5% in 2010. And we can say we are now less than 1% as of 2021. South Africa, as I said, was the first country in the Sub-Saharan Africa to approve, fully approve a PrEP, and it's now being made available uh, to people at risk, uh, such as commercial sex workers, men having sex with men, uh, young women, adult, uh, adolescents, uh, and anyone who perceives themselves to be at risk. So why do we focus on, on, on HIV? Uh, on women. We note that risky sexual behavior is still a reality in South Africa. And this is a study that comes out from the South African Demo Demographic and Health Survey published in 2016. Um, despite high HIV prevalence in South Africa, 
South African adults still engage in a high risk sexual behavior. Um, and we're looking at the statistics there in terms of the number of sexual partners, 70% of men and 5% of women reporting having two or more sexual partners in the past 12 months. Condom usage is still at a very low rate. And we can see there amongst women, uh, condom usage is actually lower, 58% and 65% for men. Furthermore, when you're looking at it in terms of um, uh, and women and men in the age group between 15 and 49, uh, they reported to have had uh, sexual activity with a partner who's never their spouse with them at 45% and 55% respectively. So it says quite clearly a risky sexual behavior is still a reality in the South African context. So, however, if we're looking at our triple five, triple nine five targets, we note quite clearly that South Africa is done very well. Um, those in the field of HIV would remember that we, we used to talk about uh, triple 90, but now uh, the target has been uh, rushed up a little bit. We've gone up to um, 95%. We have achieved the first 90, so we're closer to 95 in terms of people knowing their HIV status. And as a cascade of those who know their status, 90% of them are on treatment, and this says 72% with HIV are on treatment, of which 90% have a viral load suppressed. And that says of all the people that are estimated to be with HIV, that 66% have a suppressed viral load. So this is a cascade you're taking from the, the first number and then you, you extrapolate to the next target. So we are saying as of 2020, we are doing fairly well. Um, there is still a gap that we need to be able to, to look at it. So let's put this into context and say, who actually would qualify for PrEP in this in setting of South Africa? And here I've looked at the best case scenario and crudely looking at the numbers. South Africa has a total population of 60 million. And if one assumes that um, there are about 8 million, 7.8, 8 million who need art, those actually uh, could be taken out of the, of the game. So meaning we're left with about 52 million adults and adolescent children who are HIV negative. That would seem to be the, the, uh, the largest chunk of patients or, or individuals out in, in the community who actually require PEP. However, we would still need to be able to, to look at uh, children under the age of 15 years, not sexually active. So if we take out 5 million out of that, we're left with about 47 million adults and adolescents who could be uh, actual, actual candidates. And then we then say to, um, to these 47 million South Africans, how many of them uh, are, 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 are defined as low risk? I've been looking at behavior studies, I've been looking at uh, uh, social-based studies, and the, 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 the crude estimation seems to suggest that 80% of adult and adolescent population in South Africa is, seems to be at low risk. This is an estimation uh, that I, I came through after I looked at a few things. So it means basically, if you are to take uh, out 38 million, you possibly are left with 9 million individuals possibly could qualify for HIV PrEP um, uh, over, over time. So it would say that group actually uh, fits the bill for, for HIV PrEP. Um, this is a crude analysis applicable to the South African reality that looks at behavior, that looks at social factors that looks at the, those determinants, the structural factors. This is my own crude analysis to say, possibly about 9 million individuals. It says anyone who is involved with HIV clinical care or any kind of uh, clinical care should be looking at this target as a target for a group of people that will possibly need uh, HIV PrEP. However, I looked at um, uh, the Tembisa uh, model. 
their, their assumptions are completely different. They note that the current PrEP coverage in South Africa is less than 1%. And interestingly, instead of using the population-based numbers, they go on and look at the HIV incidence per, per year. So as of 2020, we said there were 230,000 uh, new infections. And from the Tembisa model, they say that to be the target of your, your patients that are at risk. They use that as a proxy to say, if you have 230 new infections, you then need to be able to target that every year. And they estimated that um, if PrEP coverage was about 13%, of the male and female population in 2027 20, by recruiting and using the long acting, carbotegravir long acting, particularly in the risk, uh, 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 high risk populations. This would advert about 20% of new infections over a period of 20 years. That's the Tembisa model. This is um, data that you can easily um, um, find on hivdata.org. Uh, Dot ZA. There is a new model called the, the uh, Naomi model, uh, which is slightly different from the Tembisa model. But uh, I wanted to share with you that in this particular case, they, lack, they look at HIV incidence per year as people needing uh, 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 PrEP coverage. Of 230 new infections, 30,000 new infections that we are seeing there, we're saying predominantly those are women. So if you were to looking at expanding PrEP coverage, particularly with the long acting um, carbotegra van, it's estimated that what you need, really need is uh, 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 to, for this HIV PrEP to be more cost effective, you need to bring the price down of, of uh, your long acting injectables. Uh, to two times the price of, of oral PrEP to an equivalent, if you're looking at the exchange rate as of today of around 320 rand per injection. And it says that if you could bring in that long acting, it could significantly impact on the HIV epidemic substantially, particularly for people who are at high risk of acquiring HIV. From a strategic response, uh, PEPFA, uh, has ad adopted a, a program referred to as DREAMS. Uh, here it looks at um, uh, building resilience, uh, getting uh, programs going on in terms of in a determined way, empowering women, looking at an age free generation by 2030. They must be mentoring in terms of support of, of people using a combination of prevention methods we must be able to deliver this prevention method in a safe way. Um, and here I'm talking about a package of, of care that includes um, circumcision, uh, a package of care that includes um, abstinence, being faithful, condom usage, uh, a package of care that is evidence-based. The Department of Health in South Africa has actually um, come up with its own shield concurrence campaign. And so it, it talks about a multi-sectorial intervention, which looks at the different layers of effects of prevention. And we seeing a, a prep uh, within the context of this combination approaches. So what are these combination approaches? Your A, B, C, D, abstinence, being faithful, consistent, correct condom usage, and D being a very important component because treatment as, as prevention, as you know, uh, is a very important component. And as we put our patients on art, we are preventing them from getting HIV from the HPTN 0552 study. HIV testing remains an important issue. Addressing alcohol and drug abuse remains also a very important issue. And addressing intimate and uh, partner violence and sexual violence and indeed, uh, for those who work in emergency setting, the use of uh, 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 post-exposure prophylaxis where applicable uh, would come in quite handy as well. Is there evidence to suggest that um, a PEP, PrEP works? And this slide here is a summary 
of a good number of studies, starting off from the IPEGAI study. Uh, this was a study done out in Europe, and it showed that on-demand Truvada, which is a combination of TDF and FTC, had an efficacy of around uh, 86%. Then, then you had um, the PROUD study, uh, also done out in Europe in the UK, 86%. And I want you to look at what's happening here. As we go down, we're now going to Kenya and Uganda and discounted couples as the partner study. We're going down to 75%. And with daily turnover there, we go down to 6 7%. And as we go down from oral prep to IPREX, and we're going more to uh, the African countries, Botswana, um, out in, in, in Southeast Asia and South Africa, the efficacy actually drops. And I want you to look at the MTN uh, 003 and the voice study where they looked at uh, uh, Tenofovir on its own. There was actually an effect that giving PrEP was dangerous in the sense that you have a minus 49% effect. And the Caprissa study out in Deben where they're using topical PrEP had an efficacy of around 39%. Um, and when you took it out again to look at the tenor of the gel, it came to 5%. The FETS study, this was an interesting study. It showed that using uh, a tenor of the gel versus placebo did not have an effect at all. So, so there is an effect. So people started asking and saying, why are we seeing so much of a difference in terms of these studies from 86% all the way down to 0%? And what was seen quite clearly was that the reduction in HIV incidence was strongly related to the adherence based on the pill counts and also based on the concentration of your TDF in, in, in the blood. You can see that the higher the concentration, the lower the incidence. So the, uh, the higher the re reduction, sorry, the higher the are the, uh, the reduction in incidence. So you can see the PROUD study and your EPEGI study are quite up there and our FETS uh, study are at 0%. So adherence becomes extremely important when you're looking at uh, the oral PrEP uh, in, in men and, 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 and transgender women. So adherence does impact effectiveness. So as we think about HIV PrEP, it's quite important to be able to consider adherence as a key component of that particular issue. You can see as well in terms of the weekly adherence, in terms of the estimated TDF concentrations, a seven dose uh, had a 99% reduction uh, in, uh, of the HIV risk. And you can see there two doses went down to 76%. Even at two doses per week, um, you still have a, a quite a significant uh, reduction in risk. So it must be emphasized that it's a reduction in risk if you're looking at those percentages. It's not number of people, it's a reduction in risk. Who is eligible for PrEP is the HIV negative population, particularly the key populations who are seen to harbor HIV. And therefore, if you are able to control HIV in that particular group, it has an impact to the general populations. Your patients are for oral PrEP should not have contraindications to TDF and FTC. We should be able to exclude acute infection. And importantly, the adherence issue must come in quite strongly. There are contraindications to PrEP and they have changed over a period of time. And I'll share that with you a little bit. Pre-existing HIV infection and how do we pick, pick it up? Patients with uh, any flu-like illness would actually be excluded from PrEP. You would actually exclude that uh, by doing testing before you actually do it. And the creatine clearance um, of less than 60 mils per minute. Also, adolescents um, with a weight less than 35 kilograms or less than, this should be 10 years of age and not, have not attained a tenor stage three sexual maturity or greater are also excluded. And this is a contraindication related to TDF. If a patient is not willing or able to adhere to a daily PrEP, 
if we're looking at uh, guidelines currently, that person is um, is um, excluded and uh, from PrEP. Pregnancy is no longer a contraindication. It's not an absolute contraindication because ten of them can now be safely used in pregnancy. So it's a category B um, uh, uh, a pregnancy medication and is considered to be fairly safe. Um, if you're looking at the risk of born abnormalities in, in, in babies and uh, neural tube defects, uh, the it defects are not higher compared to other uh, ARV agents. So it's review studies have shown uh, the two to be safe during uh, conception, pregnancy, and breastfeeding. So it can be given during that, those days. And we're saying with reference to, uh, 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 to those particular instances in HIV negative women, when women acquire HIV, they are acute seroconverters, the viral load tends to be high and they can easily transmit HIV to their babies. So it's quite important to be able to give PrEP in these particular instances for the social and the cultural factors that I've mentioned. So it's an additional tool to reduce uh, HIV acquisition in that particular group of women. What are the other important considerations? TDF and FTC is an active, uh, the active ingredients against uh, hepatitis B. And hence patients may develop uh, an immune reconstitution uh, inflammatory syndrome when they start out and also when you discontinue. So it's quite important as a baseline to be able to have your hepatitis B surface antigen and also your patients with uh, bone abnormalities because TDF is associated with a risk of bone loss, which brings in uh, the issue around TAF, uh, the cousin, or if you like, an analog to TDF. TDF being the larger molecule, TAF being the smaller molecule. TDF, you typically give it at 300 milligrams, whereas tenofovir, alafenamide, you'd give it at 25 milligrams Efficacy-wise, the uh, TAF and TDF um, are, are known to, uh, 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 TAF is non-inferior and you have less renal and bone effects when you use TAF. Um, another Im important consideration is that TDF being a renal toxin, sh it should not be co-administered with other nephrotoxic drugs such as your aminoglycosides, amphotericin B, and are commonly used and say it's Rufen and uh, Diclofenac. Your standard uh, TB medication does not interfere with PrEP, particularly oral PrEP. There's no need for uh, those, those adjustments. And uh, good news is that MDR TB medication, there is no need uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, exclude uh, 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 PrEP because we're now using uh, the oral uh, short course uh, medication because your aminoglycosides, canamycin and uh, capriomycin and gentamicin are no longer part of the MDR-TB treatment. So this is a very good, uh, good news, if you like. Standard hormonal contraception um, does not affect PrEP. Uh, it can be given uh, at any time. It does not have, remember this is dual medication, uh, TDF and FTC. Uh, it does not affect a uh, contraceptive effect, be it oral, combined oral contraception or injectables or the implant. Um, and currently, if you're looking at your studies, uh, there are no published studies in terms of use of under the age of 18 years. But giving our source, Socioeconomic interests, uh, 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 socioeconomic uh, environment in, 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 in South Africa, um, one would be able to look at uh, use of uh, TDF and FTC under the ages of 15 years, as long as um, they meet the criteria of the maturity of age, tenor stage, and also the weight above 35 kilograms. An important component that is always uh, comes up when we're looking at, at PrEP is that patients can seroconvert while on PrEP, be it on uh, oral or long-acting PrEP as 
PrEP is not, is not always 100% uh, protected. Therefore, it's important to say those patients who, who uh, uh, fail their PrEP, we should be offered triple uh, uh, art regimens consisting of the same component, TDF, FTC, and we add, and in this particular case, you uh, add an in integrase trans and fray inhibitor, your instis such as DTG, a diluted gravia as your, as your third component there. So you actually would need uh, to be able to do that. Uh, studies have shown that if you put them on uh, art, they actually suppress uh, uh, equally as if, uh, uh, as compared to patients who are art naive. So this is, I'll go through, through this pretty quickly. What do you need to do when you're initiating PrEP? You need to be able to do the HIV test. We still use our standard algorithm with rapid tests, test number one, test number two, and if both tests are, 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 are positive or reactive, that person would be will not qualify for PrEP, but a patient who has a first rapid test turning out uh, negative, that person would be able to assess clinically, and if they're clinically well, they qualify. As opposed to Europe and, and USA, we do not recommend nucleic acid testing, your DNA PCR, uh, because of um, cost issues. Uh, uh, DNA PCR is reserved for, for testing in children. In adults, we go with uh, the HIV rapid test. Creatine clearance is something that would uh, be, be done to identify pre-existing disease. And I, as I said, the hepatitis B status must be looked at to look at those patients with hepatitis B uh, uh, infection, chronic infection, and to make a distinction between those eligible for, uh, for, for vaccination against hepatitis B or those who re require treatment. An ALT would be required if the hepatitis B surface antigen is positive, to look at a necro uh, uh, inflammation of the, of the liver. And those patients would require referral uh, for, for treatment. Fortunately, TDF and FTC uh, uh, also treat um, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, hepatitis B and HIV. All patients should actually have a urine pregnancy test to identify those who are pregnant, RPR, and your syndromic STI screening to diagnose and treat those. The urine uh, 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 dipstick is also an important issue. And currently we are using the presence of proteinuria, significant proteinuria to be able to, uh, to know if there's pre-existing uh, renal function. Um, we don't do bone uh, density measurements. There is, it's not necessary and it's not uh, practical in our settings. What would you prescribe for PrEP? It's oral prep, a Truvada, one tablet once a day, and to keep it very simple, it's one tablet, one blue tablet once a day. The generic versions of Truvada are now acceptable as well, and they can be used very e easily. So at initiation, you'd provide a one month supply. At one month, you'd repeat HIV tests to be able to pick up those who have been in the window period, and thereafter, you can provide a thin three monthly su supply. Every three months, you re repeat the HIV test and provide a thereafter a three monthly supply. It's important to be able to do that three month supply. So that's your oral prep. And I want to emphasize that if you're looking at um, the current guidelines, the saying one tablet of Truvada or TDF FTC once daily, orally. So there is no space for on demand uh, uh, prep in our settings. What are the major side effects of, of, of our oral PrEP? We're saying TDF uh, causes renal toxicity, causes metabolic complications, bone loss, and in some instances is associated with hepatic steatosis. Um, currently a switch to a Bacavan containing regimen, which would mean Dumiva has not yet been uh, researched and therefore uh, we still say those patients with major side effects should actually be pulled off uh, from TDF and FTC. The minor side effects, which are typically self-limiting, GI symptoms, unintentional weight loss as a, 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 a side effect of lipoatrophy, 
uh, three, uh, FTC or amtricitabine is known to cause skin hyperpigmentation and there are less predictable effects such as skin hypersensitive reactions and also your flare-ups on patients who have chronic hepatitis B. Uh, uh, when they stop a rebound or when they start, you can get an iris and your patients may present with right upper quadrant pain, itchy skin and yellow eyes, jaundice. How do you follow up your patients on PrEP? We say at month one, and then every three months, you address side effects, adherence becomes very important. And your creatine clearance, you do it at one month, every three months for the first year. And then after that, you do it annually. TDF induced nephrotoxicity typically kicks in within the first three months. And if it doesn't, you tend to have it as a long-term side effect, uh, side effect. Um, and it's not that common. We're saying it's between four to 5% of patients that are exposed to it. So it's quite important to be able to, to look at that renal function carefully, considering the number of patients that are potentially targets or potentially candidates of, uh, of PrEP. STI screening would be done at every visit and you can then issue a medication. Behavioral and sexual reduction, sex risk reduction counseling should be done at every visit. When to do it is continue PrEP. Indeed, there are instances like that. If a patient zero converts on, uh, on PrEP, that patient will be stopped and they should be started on ART. If there are any safety concerns, if the patient is not adhering or they simply say they do not need or want PrEP anymore. So PrEP is not a lifelong medication as we would put with, our, I would say with our patients on ART. Or if a patient no longer meets the eligibility criteria, there's a change in terms of their risk profile, they would actually discontinue PrEP. There are measures that we are looking at and literature has shown that the risk of HIV drug resistance is, sits at around 3%. And if you plunk 3% into 9 million, that could actually um, contribute to a, a very high number of patients who come in into the art program uh, having pre-drug uh, resistance. So it's important to look at adherence at every visit, support your patients as you would support your patients on, on art uh, with, uh, in the same way you do with PrEP. Adequate drug supply is, is very important. You need to reassess uh, the eligibility criteria at every visit and make decisions, discontinue when the patient's profile has changed and there is no substantial risk. Indeed, we have seen risks changing over a period of time. Let me share with you um, what the DHSS and the US and the WHO and the Canadian guidelines would say about PrEP. Um, the 211 oral uh, PrEP is actually uh, advocated. Um, amongst men having sex with men. Basically, this is on demand or event-driven event PrEP taken for three days and then you stop. And as you have seen in the EPGI study and the uh, Proud study, there was an 86% um, um, efficacy that you looked at. Also, uh, if you're looking at uh, the combination of um, TAF, um, um, uh, and FTC, this is also something that's advocated. And if you're looking at the Discover a study, this is a, a study, it has shown that TDF uh, versus TAF um, combination, it has been shown to be non-inferior. However, you wouldn't use your TAF uh, and FTC combination on an on-demand basis. Um, we may see these guidelines, our guidelines changing to TAF in future. So I thought I should be able to share this with you. So this is the Discover, uh, Discover study. It's a, an international randomized control trial, which looked at um, men having sex with men and transgender women. It showed that the combination FTC-TAF was non-inferior at 48 weeks and, and 96 uh, uh, week non analysis. And importantly, there were significantly better bone and, and renal safety outcomes with a TAF combination. So if there are concerns about that, 
we may be able to look at uh, that combination. Now that brings me now to the long acting prep. Um, and there are two molecules that I would like to share with you, dapivrin, a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor and carbodegravir, a long acting injection. So this is an INSTI, um, integrase a strand transfer inhibitor or given singly. And these have particular uh, uh, bearing when we're coming to women. So let's share the ring study. Uh, the ring study was a study where a monthly dapivirin ring was used in cisgender women aged between 18 to 45, South Africa and Uganda uh, from April 2012 to 2016. What is dapivirin uh, ring is basically a long acting uh, NNRTI, which is packaged into with nanoparticles into a dapivirin ring. Just like we would use a, a female condom, the dapivirin ring is inserted to sit around the cervix. The cervix is seen to be a site of HIV acquisition in women, uh, particularly if it's a cervical ectopy and the like. It releases your dapivirin at a very, very slow pace. It dissipates into the area and it remains there for quite some time. What were the outcomes of the dapivirin uh, 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 of the ring study? Um, if you're looking at um, the incidence, there was a 30% lower incidence overall if you're looking at uh, this particular issue in this particular study. And I want you to look at the age groups. If you're looking at uh, age groups less than 21, there was actually a much less incidence of, um, amongst the participants saying basically if you use it at less than 21 years of age, uh, the dapivirin will not be as efficacious. But if you use it in, in women uh, above 21 years of age, your efficacy would actually go up. And if we're looking at uh, the earlier uh, statistics where most of HIV is happening, we're saying it's above the 21 to, 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 uh, uh, to, 20, to 49 years of age this is where the uh, ring would actually work uh, perfectly. Why the pivot ring? The pivot ring um, is a self, uh, women control con uh, 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 HIV prep, which can be inserted and it remains hidden in the cervix. It doesn't interfere with sexual activity. They don't feel it and properly fitted, it doesn't fall off. Uh, men also do not feel it during sexual activity, but importantly, it protects women where the violence is, is, is common. They extended these studies, the, the ring study to open level uh, uh, extensions, uh, two studies that come into mind. Uh, first, it was the Aspire, then after that, the, the HOP and the DREAM studies. You can see that in the open level studies, meaning uh, where the, uh, the placebo incidence was, is, is estimated, um, you can see that in the HOP study, the efficacy actually went up to 39%. And in the DREAM study, it went up to uh, 63%, telling us that possibly um, with supported good adherence uh, 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 in communities, we could achieve better protection of women if the dapivirin ring is used. Is it acceptable? Uh, and uh, there are quite a lot of studies um, that have been done to say, is it acceptable to women? Uh, there has been quite a lot of studies done out in Europe and also um, uh, done in, on the African continent. It has shown that uh, most women accept it and they readily use it. And as of July, 2020, the European Medicine Agency had a positive opinion on it. And a three-month version, this is uh, uh, typically uh, what's in development. Currently, you give it at one month. And to make things better, there is a core formulation with an, a, 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 a levonorgestrel that is in development, where you can now combine uh, the uh, dapivirin ring with uh, contraception, giving it every three months 
So a woman would come into a facility three times in, in, a, in a four times in a year, so three monthly. And if you check the SAPRA, SAPRA has actually had it approved uh, by one company, Libasi Pharmaceutical Company, uh, as the P ring is registered as of March 2022. Um, as far as uh, the Department of Health uh, roll out, we are not very familiar with it, but it has now been registered with a, a SAPRA. So this is something that could be considered for women. What about long acting injectables as far as HIV PrEP is concerned? Um, we have carbotegravir and integrase strand transfer inhibitor. It's a long acting uh, injection. Is given to people who uh, do not have a HIV at a dose of 600 milligrams intramuscularly, four weeks apart for the first two injections. And thereafter, you can give it every, two, every eight weeks for the prevention of HIV acquisition. Now, you're comparing oral, moving on to the cervical ring, which is uh, the tapirin, and now we're coming to an injectable. I want you to be clear with that. So this is given every two months. There are important studies that have uh, shed light and uh, influence our uh, the, the influence the decision on us adopting the HPTN, uh, uh, adopting the, uh, the HIV PrEP and the long acting injections. The HPTN 083 study and 084 study. These studies were done um, comparing oral um, TDF and uh, FTC and injectable uh, uh, carbotegravam in men having sex with men and transgender women, that's the 083 study, and the cisgender women, uh, the 084 study. Uh, the method is up there for everyone to see. First step one, you give uh, a placebo versus oral medication of carbotegravam. And then your step two then looks at from week five, every two months you're giving a placebo uh, TDF versus the injectable and the other is placebo injection versus uh, oral medication over a period of approximately three years. And then your step three, moving back to oral medication. This study, particularly the 083 study was stopped prematurely because it showed positive effects. Um, so from 2016 to, 20, to May 2020, and I'll show you the, the key studies, the key results. The use of carbotegravir long acting injection resulted in a 66% reduction in HIV risk compared with oral PrEP a much, much significant improvement if you compare to PrEP. 4,566 in terms of the numbers, 50% daily PrEP and 50% on long acting carbotegravir. 37% were largely from the US and of the US population, most of them were black uh, participants. 26% and, and sorry, 26 was the median age that we're looking at. So this is a risk population of um, your groupings that we're looking at. The HPTN enrolled cisgender women at risk across uh, uh, several countries in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, included, including uh, South Africa. Randomized, controlled blind, multi-site, and the intervention group received the injection and the control group received uh, oral medication. And analysis was done in 48 and 96 weeks. And in this HPTN 084 study, there was an 88% relative risk reduction of HIV, HIV acquisition compared to oral PrEP, telling us that giving injectables compared to oral PrEP had a better uh, efficacy. What remains to be seen is whether this uh, would be more effective in the, in the general population. So if you put these two studies together, um, we'll say the relative risk reduction is around 75%. 
among study participants. And the WHO has come out with a very strong uh, recommendation, which says long acting injectable carbon dioxide may be offered as an additional prevention of choice, a choice for people at substantial risk as part and parcel of the combination um, uh, uh, prevention approaches. And the evidence there is a conditional recommendation based on the efficacy studies because it's not yet rolled out. Um, there is moderate certainty of evidence, which is fairly good and fairly acceptable. So we're saying we now have possibly in our hands something that can be used in the long term. What does the future look like? The future will consider implants in the form of pellets, in the form of uh, um, subcutaneous uh, uh, issues and the broadly neutralizing antibodies is something that's, uh, that's being studied. I would like to be able to, um, to uh, end this discussion and perhaps uh, have some key take, take, uh, take home points uh, for this evening. And they say Basadi Batswara Tipa Kamukhaleng. Um, women are at the brunt of the HIV uh, epidemic in South Africa. They are faced with many challenges, social, structural, violence. You can mention a, a good number of things. We now have something that we can uh, give them to enhance their defense so that at least when women are taken care of in South Africa, we can have better outcomes for the whole nation. It's been shown quite clearly that uh, when you intervene, bring interventions that improve the lot of women uh, across many studies, you're looking at your, your SDGs, you look at um, education, you're looking at reduction in poverty, uh, it has a positive be benefit to society. Two methods for HIV PrEP have already been approved. That's your oral PrEP and also your Dapivirin ring. Uh, the SAPRA is still uh, considering uh, 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 approving Capodecravan and it would appear uh, that approval will come in very soon. We should be able to consider PrEP within the context of combination prevention methods. And uh, I would like to encourage all healthcare providers present here, including the non-medical uh, participants uh, uh, in the audience. Um, we should actually engage ourselves in training so that we can raise awareness on HIV PrEP because it offers us an opportunity to protect our patients to begin with, those that are in zero discount relationships, um, also our families and the communities at, at large. I think um, when we're looking at an evidence-based uh, type of prevention such as PrEP, we have a better chance of uh, ending the HIV epidemic, preferably by 2030. Uh, however, if you're looking at the indicators, it's unlikely that we will end this HIV epidemic by 2030. The estimation is that possibly we're going to be able to, to reach that ending of the epidemic by 2042. On that note, I would like to bring this discussion to, to an end and perhaps hand over to Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Bila uh, to be able to take some questions, take some discussions on this very important uh, topic. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bogo. Quite, uh, someone says quite insightful and refreshing, uh, the talk that you've just given us. And uh, indeed, uh, as, as you've indicated, you know, the, the women are the bedrock of society and they are the ones who are able to keep the nation uh, rocking and moving. And we need to protect our women indeed. And, and thanks for that insightful discussion. And we'll, we'll take questions. You know, listening to you, you know, you're painting, you know, when you were giving the, the long-term uh, injectables and also talk about the, the broader community. It, it was as if we, we, we each are closer to finding a, a cure or, or even maybe 
maybe my question that could be asking is, with all these advancements, technological advancements in medical knowledge and also pharmaceutical advancements, why are we so far away from getting a vaccine for this? For HIV prevention? As of last year, thank you for that question, Dr. Biller. As of last year, there has been an HIV vaccine that has come up. We still await the results of that vaccine. However, vaccines, as far as HIV is concerned, uh, is a challenging field. I'm not an expert on vaccines on HIV. However, it would appear that HIV evades uh, the immune system. It uh, replicates pretty fast. It's able to change and adapt to the, to the vaccines. Uh, and it's very difficult to be able to get it. However, that said, uh, there's quite a lot of um, work that is being done in the HIVQ space, uh, notably in, in the US, but also in other countries. Not, um, here I'm referring to, to Israel, uh, Russia, they're actually involved in, uh, in, uh, in the HIVQ research. But as far as the vaccine is concerned, uh, there isn't that much hope. I've seen quite a lot of studies on HIV vaccines, the ones that look at surface proteins, the ones that look at um, conserved areas and uh, attenuated uh, uh, viruses. Most of the studies have not yielded any positive outcomes because HIV evolves pretty fast and seems to evade both the immune system and also the, uh, the vaccine. So we're not able to mount a, 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 a uh, uh, sufficiently robust um, uh, immune response to, uh, uh, to, to, to HIV through vaccines. So our current hope, it would appear, apart from the technology of art, apart from uh, the HIV uh, prep that I've just presented here, and this is pushing to the structural issues of, of our societies. If we could work around uh, the structural issues, poverty, the economic issues, the social, the beliefs, the myths and misconceptions that we have, and we continue raising awareness and awareness on a daily basis, this is where I think we could actually win. It would appear with HIV, the structural determinants of health uh, play a more significant role than actually the technological interventions that we, we bring. So as we grapple with structural issues, we should be able to bring in this technology to fit in into this clog and into this cog well so that we, we bring about uh, 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 the change and uh, bring about, reduce the impact of HIV over a period of time. Just to give you a context, HIV has killed more people than, than COVID. Over the past four years, it's estimated that at least about 40 million people have succumbed to, the, uh, to, uh, to HIV. HIV, even today, um, kills more people than COVID. And therefore, we should be coming up with a more nuanced approach to HIV, particularly putting more resources, putting an eye and monitoring HIV as we did with COVID. Okay. Obviously, Thanks. within the constitutional uh, uh, constraints uh, that we uh, are faced with, there is yeah. quite a lot of constitutional issues uh, that we have to to attend to. Okay. No, no, no. Thanks for that. It's nothing about the structural issues that we need to address. I to give us mm. some relief in those part. Uh, from Kidney to Rachel's wants to know if men are reluctant to test for HIV. How was the 92% of people who know their status arrived at? You know, that 95. I mean, trust that you, you say it's no longer 1999, 95, 95, 95. Thanks mm. for that your knowledge that we get. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Pardon, how do, how do they manage to achieve the 92%? Yeah. It's through awareness, and we are testing um, at facilities. Everyone who comes to a facility should be offered an HIV test. There is also quite a lot of outreach 
that's happening. There is also testing at, at the antenatal care services. Mm. Um, there are programs that are now looking at uh, men specifically, uh, men's programs. All men who, and young uh, adolescents, adolescents who undergo uh, a circumcisions are offered HIV testing. So okay. there's, there's testing across uh, different platforms and the uptake, I must say, is, is pretty good. Uh, the, the level of stigma and hesitancy to HIV testing fortunately has dropped. Okay. Uh, in addition, uh, the Department of Health has approved self-testing. So today you can, uh, you, a patient or individual can walk into a facility, into a pharmacy and, and request for an HIV test for self-testing at home. Hmm. So the, the, that testing uh, platform has actually been ex expanded and it has had very good results. Yeah. So knowing the status uh, is something that's very good. We now need to be able to expand uh, into these other HIV prevention uh, strategies. Yeah, no, that's good. We should know our status. May, John Mohaba wants to know, may you kindly provide more information on the injectable PrEP you mentioned in your ALA slides? And is this into a search phase or will it be equally registered as well? I think you, you touched on that toward the end of your presentation. Yes. Yes, Kapotagrave uh, is, as I said, is an ISD. It's a long acting. Um, it falls into the same group as the Litagravia. Uh, it's given as an injection, 600 milligrams, as I said. Um, importantly, it has side effects in the studies that I've just uh, highlighted there. It can show hepatotoxicity. And in some in individuals, you need to be able to do a full assessment if they present with a clinical picture with your liver function test or specifically the ALT. But routinely, you wouldn't give a look at, uh, at that. Um, it's long acting. So um, when patients stop the long acting injection, it um, in the HPTN0883 uh, study, it was noted to remain at very low concentrations, up to 44 weeks. In the HPTN084 study, it was it can remain within uh, the system up to 67 weeks, meaning the tail at the at, at the level of clearance can present a risk for 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 resistance, and it can compromise your your DTG containing regimens. So it's quite important to be able to look at uh, that particular issue when patients are stopping uh, their long-acting injectables uh, to continue with the uh, uh, prevention, the use of condoms for that kind of a period. As you would know, um, with oral medication, we say men, it takes up to about seven, men having sex with men, it takes about seven days for them to achieve protective levels. And in females, it takes up to about 20 days. Sure. Uh, there's a similar kind of a picture that we are getting with long acting uh, injectables it, where you need to be able to uh, prime them up with uh, an injection every four weeks to achieve the protective levels by eight weeks. And then thereafter, you can then give it every eight weeks. Um, however, the side effects are, or adverse events are, are tolerable uh, in injection site uh, reactions are quite common. So those people who are, who are scared of injections who not, not actually uh, 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 fit this bill, uh, and indeed there are people like that, but the, the, the sort of uh, self-limiting, just an injection intramuscular, yeah. one would have preferred it to be a subcutaneous injection. Um, so there are quite a, a few things there. Uh, also, a long prep, there is going to be a combination of capotegravir plus repilverine, which can be used as art. Hmm. Already the FDA has approved that. Viv Healthcare has come up with a combination called Cabenova, where you can use capotegravir together with repilverine. And it's been shown 
that uh, this combination is non inferior to oral, oral art. And if that medication is given every uh, six months. So it's two jabs mm -hmm. per year. So we are yeah. seeing the, the space of ARVs uh, changing completely in terms of uh, choices that we have as far as art is concerned. It's envisaged that this will improve adherence uh, in patients who find that uh, these long acting art medication work very well. So there's quite a bit there. So adverse events, fairly tolerable, uh, but there's a concern of drug resistance, particularly at the at clearance stage. There are currently no studies as, as you would know, because the long acting injectables have not been done. So that's an area for research where we're saying uh, uh, we need to be able to understand what the, the long-term impact of using art is in the long term. Yeah. Okay. So the, the follow-up question from Dr. Bohobe says, in discordant couples, is PrEP recommended as a lifelong treatment if the negative partner fits the clinical criteria? That's right. The HPTN052 study, which looked at the risk of acquiring HIV with treatment, if you treated the HIV positive patient, showed that uh, you would actually protect the HIV negative by reducing the likelihood by up to 96%. Mm -hmm. And in some instances, if you remove that patient who actually acquired the HIV infection, uh, it would be protecting that person by 100%. There is what is referred to as the U is equal to U uh, movement, which says if it's undetectable, it's untransmittable. Um, however, there are some instances one needs to be able to assess uh, instances uh, quite clearly. In the zero discounted couple, where you, you as the clinician assess that there is still a risk, poor adherence, for instance, if the male partner is is on art and the female partner is HIV negative, breastfeeding, pregnant, or just conceived, mm -hmm. I would actually give um, PrEP as an additional protective measure. Mm -hmm. uh, mindful of the, H the results of the HPTN052 study. So U is equal to U. Yes, I, I agree, but uh, one would like to consider the instances where there could be transmission. Let's look at breastfeeding. Where there is uh, 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 mastitis, inflammation, the risk of HIV transmission goes up. Hmm. Let's look at the intrapartum period where there is uh, trauma, injuries, and the like, the risk of HIV transmission goes up. So there's an additional way I'll actually consider HIV prep in those kind of patients. Okay. In commercial sex workers and other issues, that is a given. Males having sex with men is a given. But anyone who perceives themselves to be at risk in serodiscounted couples, one would actually like to be able to consider that because anyone who perceives themselves at risk to be at risk, they are indeed at risk mm. because they know better than we do as, as clinicians. Yeah, I like the way you put it. Mm. If you know it, it's risk, you're at risk. Yes, exactly. Mm. And if a patient is found to be HIV positive on PrEP, do you switch uh, to second line or do you continue on the TE or TLD regimen? That's right. The Nadia trial and the other trials have come up very clearly. We would actually switch those patients to the TLD regimen. As much as they've been exposed to tenofovir and lamivudine in the PrEP, it's been found that if you switch them with, into a TDF, TD, DTG containing regimen, the efficacy is the same. So the issue of first line, second line, actually is going to fall away. There's going to be one line uh, as far as we're looking at it. TLD is going to be there as your first line Mm -hmm. Your patients who fail second line, provided they, ha they have been on uh, TDF and, 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 and 3TC, can be actually be switched to, to a TLD. So the Nadia trial has come out very strongly. Uh, and I think um, Dr. K presented um, uh, 
uh, that session some time ago around the, the three important studies that have completely changed our thinking around the TLD. Yeah. So your patient who fails uh, HIV prep can be switched to TLD without any, any, any challenges. Okay. No, thanks for that. Uh, and Dr. Mashiro uh, says, so what has been the uh, reduction rate with the reduction rate in HIV incidence at a community level? Okay, right. As you have noted, the, we have dealt with efficacy and efficacy is seen in clinical trials. So your HPTN 083 study, 084 study, all the studies that are put up there, those are efficacy study. Now you now need to be able to, to, to take it out on an open level, assuming an, an estimated HIV incidence with placebo, mm -hmm. meaning there's background uh, incidence with placebo. Therefore, if you're looking at most of these studies, it hasn't been shown at community level. We need now to be able to say, let's do some implementation research and let's find out. The only difference that we have seen is if you like, if I may just go back to this slide, the dapivirin ring, I'll quickly go back to it. The dapivirin ring, this was the efficacy studies um, when they looked at, at the clinical trial. Then they took it out to the DREAM, ASPIRE and HOPE studies. And these are implementation studies that, that have actually seen on an open level, it's extensions. So mm. this is almost a, a, a approximate what really happens in a community issues. So that's an area for research. We would like to know how much it is going to bring, bring down that uh, uh, the HIV incidence. So how are we going to get to know that? Whereas we see the studies from the Human uh, Science Research Council, uh, this done every year, we want to see at least uh, figures coming down. If we can be able to to, uh, to cut the infection rate amongst women, cut the infection rate amongst those at risk, we are likely to see a dip. They have noted that a B uh, male circumcision has actually brought down um, HIV transmission or HIV acquisition to be specific in men by a margin of up to something like 42%. Whereas in the trials that were done, it showed that HIV acquisition re is reduced by up to 60%. So it's, yet, it's not yet known what HIV PrEP will, will do as far as reducing HIV incidence in community levels. We're yet to see the results. Yeah, okay. And talking about the ring, um, it, it says uh, Dr. Desai's is great talk, but, but how safe is the ring in pregnancy? It's it, in pregnancy. Yes. Okay. The, the ring releases uh, the dapivirin, the NRTI, locally. There is little, if any, systemic uh, 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 circulation of, of the NRTI. I, I haven't come across any study that looks at the use of the, the ring in pregnancy. Mm. These were done in non-pregnant women. Okay. So it's something that perhaps I, I need to look up and perhaps you, we could look, all cl uh, clinicians that are present here could be able to look up and we share that information. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen some clinicians working in the HIV space here. I'm sure they can share information mm -hmm. something like this here. I'm going to ask, uh, there are two questions from Dr. Mashiro. Uh, I'll read both of them that you can respond to them. One is that what has been acceptance, uh, knowledge, and attitude of PrEP in, mm -hmm. in the general population. Then he goes on to say that uh, okay. some facts about poor uh, results in Uganda or Kaya poor, and mm -hmm. user knowledge, negative community perception, stigma, low mm -hmm. perceived risk of transmission. Mm -hmm. By inference, can this apply to South Africa too? Currently, the uptake, as I said, in South Africa is less than 1%. If you're looking at uh, the 2017 um, uh, figures, they noted that the only 12,000 uh, participants were accepting PrEP in very high risk areas, 
and you were talking about um, commercial sex workers, a man having sex with men, the, the vulnerable populations, migrant populations, mm-hmm. there's still quite a lot of lack of awareness. Um, there's still a lot of stigma. There's still quite more than anything else, lack of awareness than stigma. Because the ring is something that can be hidden, can be concealed. The injectables, again, uh, gives you a sense of, of stigma, gives a sense of promiscuity as well. So given the, uh, the, uh, the studies on acceptability in Uganda and other African countries, we do not know what, what will happen in South Africa, but it appears, and I do have a study here that comes out from Cape Town, Kailiche. Most patients were ready to accept the injectable because the injectable could be given at the same time with injectable contraceptives. So you would match the, the, the clinic visits with that of contraception and also give at the same time in order to conceal the stigma that's associated with injectables, uh, 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 injectable HIV PrEP. So we really don't know. Let's give it a shot and perhaps let's see what, what happens. Uh, yeah. There's still a lot of hesitance and most of the hesitance comes through because of lack of knowledge. Uh, and one would like to be able to raise the level of awareness amongst the general population. Yeah. Uh, we started uh, uh, doing a training on HIV PrEP in 2016. And amongst the participants that I dealt with, there were quite a lot of concerns. And most of these concerns typically start with uh, uh, clinicians themselves. I've been uh, in HIV, the HIV field for quite a long time. I know the hesitancy to, uh, to ARV usage. People thought ARVs do not work, but bit by bit, as people saw results, uh, today people readily accept uh, ARVs. Uh, so we need to be able to raise this awareness based on the studies, based on what, what uh, uh, the benefits that we can see. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what Dr. Mutemu says. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. About it. Mm-hmm. yeah, I think this is what Dr. Bongani Mutemu says, that this talk is quite, has been quite insightful. Mm-hmm. And has gained a lot of knowledge and will be able to answer questions that uh, his patients always ask him about mm-hmm. PrEP versus uh, PP. And thank you very much, Doc. Yeah, we're mm-hmm. coming to a close. Uh, the last yeah. question is from oh. Dr. Dan Mohale. Mm-hmm. Uh, he says, can you shed some light on you? Or a protocol adopted at the state antenatal clinics for pregnant women. And for how long must the rationale appears to be given blanket? Shouldn't it be according to risk stratification? Definitely, uh, as we stated, the HIV prep is patients who are at risk. The first, we're looking at commercial sex workers, men having sex with men based on their risk profile. We, we, we noted that uh, up to about 58% of uh, commercial sex workers are HIV infected. Uh, if you're looking at men having sex with men, the HIV prevalence done in one particular study uh, showed that uh, the HIV prevalence was between 50 to 80% in three metropoles, uh, Devon, Johannesburg, and Cape Town. So you can tell quite clearly that the, that's a risk population. So it, it's definitely a risk uh, adjusted approach to say, we want to give to, to people that are at risk. You wouldn't give it to people that are at low risk. Women in particular uh, seem to be in, 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 a, in a vulnerable position and one would actually consider uh, giving quite a, a good number of women, particularly the adolescent girls and young women. They seem to be at high risk because they fall pregnant, but also there's high level of uh, multiple sexual partnerships, experimentation, alcohol, drug abuse, and the violence and rape that goes along with it. So they are seen to be at risk. So there's definitely a risk adjusted a particular issue. I just want to share with uh, participants here that um, 
most of the stigma uh, in one paper was seen to be driven largely by us clinicians uh, on use of uh, PrEP, use of art, use of all these interventions that are seen to be beneficial to, to our patients in one particular study. So one looks at uh, those uh, issues, uh, one should need to look at those issues uh, extremely carefully. So it's a risk uh, adjusted approach to say, we are not giving to anyone. Similarly, we're not giving PrEP as lifelong uh, 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 interventions. Where the risk uh, 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 goes down, there's a need to be able to stop the HIV PrEP. Yeah, I like that. I was going to ask that question. I thought maybe it's a quite a naive question to ask as to when do you stop giving PrEP, you know? Yes, you definitely Most of that stop. you spoke about, you know, structural uh, condition that we need, to, if we overcome those conditions, perhaps mm. that's the time that uh, risk behavior changes. That's but right. gives us, this brings us to the last last question now. Uh, by, have I lost that question now? Yeah, Dr. Blaudzi says, after how many skipped PrEP doses does one lose the protection thereof? It appears the lowest uh, the dose that you have is about two doses. Um, it's, there is no paper that has actually given the number of pills, I'm talking about oral PrEP, um, that actually gives how many doses have been missed. But it would appear two doses per week would be uh, adequate. Um, in patients who are seen to be skipping their, their medication, and I say this very carefully, one would consider a strategy of on-demand prep, mm -hmm. where you're using a 2 one, one approach. What is a 2 one, one approach? You give a double dose of Truvada on the first day, and then you follow it with one tablet, and then a, another tablet on the third day. This is on an event-driven approach. Let me give a scenario. Over a, a weekend, there's a party and things happen. You could say to this group of people that are seen to be at risk, they take their medication two on Friday, two tablets on Friday, one on Saturday, the other on Sunday, and then they stop. That's on-demand prep. And then on Monday, they continue with, uh, without any medication. As you have seen in the EPIGAI and the PROUD study, that approach and the approach that they're looking at, at the Canadians, the Europeans, and the Americans, the on-demand prep does work. <clears throat> Similarly, we're seeing um, miners who are mainly in the mining communities, when they go back home, uh, if, the, if, the, if the woman in the village is HIV negative, she could actually consider on-demand PrEP during the period of December. That's from December, uh, January up to Feb. And then when the men returns to work, they can cycle off. So it can be cycling on and cycling off the HIV PrEP. Although, as I say, uh, this uh, on-demand PrEP is not in is not recommended according to the Department of Health guidelines. Mm. I want to say that and put a disclaimer to that note. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Doc. Uh, we've come to the end of the, the presentation. I'm going to ask Dr. John Bokopos, the Group Occupational Health Manager Clinics to do the closing remarks. Good evening, colleagues. Uh, good evening. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lawrence, for a um, for an insightful presentation. I think this is this has been actually the the resounding message out of you know the participants that are in the the meeting today that it has been insightful and uh, and it has been very informative. And I think um, it is discussions you know and presentations like these ones that remind us, you know, um, the face of our practices, you know, and the face of medicine might have taken a bit of a shift re in recent times because of the COVID, you know, pandemic. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but I think discussions like this, you know, truly remind us about, you know, the burden that we still face, you know, of um, HIV AIDS in this country and uh, and certainly in our, you know, neighboring countries. Um, and uh, and yeah, so so we really, really wish to thank you for, you know, the work that you are involved with and the, certainly the insightful presentation that you've offered here and today. So on, on behalf of, you know, Clinics Health Group and uh, the management of clinics, Dr. Bila, the head of our clinical team, and uh, and our marketing team, we, we thank you, Julie. And I really, really think that uh, we are going to have another discussion, you know, uh, on, 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 on especially on long-term, you know, um, long-acting injectables, because I think that appears to be the way of the future. And, uh, and it's going to spark a lot of interest, you know, um, in the treatment of HIV. And uh, we thank you very much, Doctor, and, uh, and good night, colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you.